Here we go. Welcome, LA Progressive friends, family, readers. Today, Dick and I are really fortunate to have David Cobb with us today. Uh, David Cobb is a progressive activist. He actually ran for president for the Green Party back in, I think that was 2004. Uh, he was also the campaign manager for Jill Stein in, the, in her 2016 presidential bid. And David's gonna talk to us about what he's been doing uh, post campaigns and what he's involved in right now. So hi, David, good to see you. Hawatlo, howdy. Uh, Hawatlo means hello uh, in Salatluk, the Wiat tribe's uh, traditional language. And I say that because I'm coming to you from Wiat ancestral territory in far northern California and northern Humboldt County, for those familiar. Uh, but also because I have the honor of speaking to you, not as an enrollee of the Wiat tribe, but an employee of the Wiat tribe. So I am the advancement manager for Dishkama Humble. Dishkama means love in Salat Luk, uh, a, a new cutting edge community land trust that is literally an arm of the Wiat, sovereign Wiat tribe. We're a federally recognized tribe. And notice I said we, Sharon, because when I'm talking about the staff, I am on staff. Uh, and as the, the, the Wiat tribal council member and tribal administrator have said, David, we hired you. Like, like, so when you're talking about tribal government, you're not elected tribal government, but you're on staff. You're an employee of the tribe, use we. If you're talking about the Wiat people, you're not Wiat, right? So that's the decolonizing uh, journey that I'm on. So I am, uh, uh, I am with the Dishkama Community Land Trust as a Wiat uh, tribal employee doing land back and affordable housing and restoration ecology and workforce development, uh, living wage jobs, incubating worker co-ops. And I have the honor of serving as the co-coordinator of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, where I work with amazing people like Kali Akuno, which is where we reconnected, and, and Emily Kawano, and Blair Evans, and Mike Strode, and Yvonne Yen Liu, and a, a host of other brilliant thinkers who were saying, you know, there is a path forward to liberation and to dismantling white supremacy and capitalism and heteropatriarchy and creating new systems in a peaceful way. And that's what I'm excited to talk to y'all about. Awesome. Yeah, so so you, you stole most of my first question because in January, we saw you at the Cooperation Los Angeles event, Packed House, you and uh, Kali Acuno uh, uh, gave a dynamite presentation. People were on the edge of their seats. It was a wonderful event. And you talked about the solidarity, solidarity economy ecosystem in Jackson, Mississippi, and where you are in Humboldt, California. Can you tell us, our listeners, what that solidarity econ economy ecosystem is and what you're doing with it in Humboldt? Well, thank you, Dick. And I, I do want to just lift up uh, the fact that, you know, uh, Dick and Sharon and the work that y'all are doing, uh, not only with this media source, but I also want to put a plug and a request in when I first met y'all at the West Coast Left Forum, bringing folks together. And boy, it sure be good. Now that we're past COVID, like I'm just going to put a little seed in. I'll come down to LA if y'all do that again. Yeah, we, we're seriously considering it. We're looking I'm glad. At, yeah. I, and I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but Dick, I do want to answer your question because what is happening in Jackson, Mississippi. Remember the heart of the neo-Confederate, the, the old Confederacy and the current fascist uh, neo-Confederate uh, movement in, in Mississippi. You have Cooperation Jackson and, and Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, here in rural Northern California, right? Just a couple of hours away from the, frankly, the lunatic right who've taken over Shasta government, right? Uh, you've got uh, Dishkama here in Indian country. Uh, you've got Idlewild, Michigan, and uh, 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 if you don't know Idlewild, it's uh, the Black Eden. Uh, it's an amazing history. There are places where ecosystems are developing that say we can meet our needs outside of the capitalist system without having to overthrow, right? Like, and that means building worker-owned cooperatives, not just for commerce. I mean, yes, for commerce, but also to teach ourselves how to make and implement decisions in a cooperative manner, to teach ourselves the democratic arts. But wait, Dick, as important as those worker co-ops are, 
the we also need to decommodify the land, right? And and to move towards the way all of us as humans once lived, and that was communal ecosystems of land that was not commodified, but was nurtured and that we were part of the land and we were in reciprocal relationship to it. So things like limited equity housing cooperatives and uh, uh, housing co-ops in general and community land trusts and food production and distribution models that are premised on whether we call it agroecology or food sovereignty, but the, the, the ways that humans once and indigenous people still do, do food production. The reason I wanted to run through all of those really quickly was to say the things that we need to survive, we ought to treat like rights. Our, our, our society ought to say collectively, we're taking care of us all together, right? Government is not some abstraction out there. If we were doing it correctly, governance would be collectively, how are we meeting human needs? And there is a way to meet human needs, to not just survive, but to genuinely thrive, to ensure that everybody has enough food to eat, everybody has adequate housing, everybody has the right to meaningful, productive work, right? Not a job that where a boss is pushing us around, but people want to work, Sharon, if by work we mean meaningful, productive activity. We have, everybody has gifts. Everybody wants to offer their gifts, right? But what we don't want to do is have it extracted. We don't want our, the surplus value of our labor stolen uh, by somebody else. So Dick, when we talk about the ecosystem, we mean how is the economy being handled? Remember economy from the Greek just means the management of the household, right? So we're thinking of our household as the natural world and within bioregions. And so what we're saying is, how can we live in a way that human needs are being met and that we're in right relationship with the rest of the world? You know what I just learned? Y'all may already know this, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if LA progressive readers and viewers knew it before I did. But did you know that in Brazil, in the, or pre-Brazil, in the Amazon, pre-contact, there were over a million humans living uh, in those jungles. And it was one of the most highly dense places for both humans and uh, biodiversity, right? This idea that it either has to be for human use or for others is it's a colonial mindset, right? Dick, an ecosystem understands the ecology of the natural world, but also the, the need for how do we facilitate human needs? Housing, food, art and culture, uh, healthcare. Like these are needs that we, can, that we can meet. And there are from the bottom up ecosystems that are developing those. And that's what I would say, ultimately y'all, we have to decolonize our own minds and return to the right relationship that our ancestors lived in. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, David. I mean, so much of what you were saying is absolutely right on. We do need to do this. And it just seems like such a big job. You know, there's this growing concern that we're in the final stages of capitalism. Every indicator suggests that, yes, we are in the final stages of capitalism. And I love what you guys are doing is you are setting up these ecosystems so that there will be almost sort of a, a dual system that is there. And when this thing collapses, there's a safety net, something for people to fall into as opposed to collapse, um, chaos, um, authoritarianism, and all the bad things that flow when people just don't know what to do. I wonder if you could talk to us about this dual power and how we can spread this knowledge. So Sharon, I love the question and what is what is embedded within the question, right? Because it is dual power, right? Like it's not either or, it's both and. Like as, as uh, you and Dick said at the very beginning in the introduction, I'm a Green Party member. I ran for president. I, I managed the Stein uh, Baraka uh, campaign for president. Uh, and I engage in electoral politics, but I'm not an electoral fetishist. Right. Like uh, I know that every movement that has been successful for not just like trying to elect good people, but to be transformational 
you need uh, a movements that are that are broad and deep, that are politically educated and meeting people's needs, and you need an electoral arm of it. And that's the dual power that we think about. We have a current system, right? Uh, but how do we create power within this system? Uh, and in, in other words, instead of going head on frontal attack, we starve the beast, right? Uh, like we withdraw out of the capitalist system as much as we can. We withdraw away from the white supremacist heteropatriarchal systems, treat ourselves differently, right? Um, I'm not saying that we don't engage in class struggle, but there's a difference in like, so it's not either or, right? It's both and resist the harm, build the new, right? So I absolutely uh, believe that we have to resist the exploitation, the oppression uh, to ourselves and, and others, right? But dual power understands that we can also create system. We are not, we don't have to stay dependent uh, on the corporate capitalist system. And Shared, I'm I'm grateful that you named cap. We are. This is not just late stage capitalism. It's literally end stage capitalism. And there's nothing to celebrate there because if we don't actually create something new, fascism, explicit fascism, is the next stage, right? And we see it developing. So what we're saying is, there is an ecological collapse. It's not coming. Can you just hold on just one moment? For some reason, Dick touched something and it made Gregory Porter begin to sing. One of our favorite artists, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> you edit that out. Well timed, nonetheless. But Sharon, the point is, it's not either or, it's both and. So we, we can build dual power by meeting people's needs, but, and we can also engage in electoral politics. And one of the things I'm excited about locally is we've created something called the North Coast People's Alliance, where registered Greens and progressive Democrats and peace and freedom uh, socialists uh, and declined estates work together in local elections. Uh, there's a rich history in this country called the Nonpartisan League, where people were, were like, like, I don't know about y'all, but I grow weary of the constant battle between party affiliation. I don't think it's helpful. What I'll say is this. I spend most of my time now building alternatives and working with people uh, that agree with me. And I don't even talk about electoral politics except during elections. But when I do talk about elections and uh, uh, or when I do talk about electoral politics during elections, I ask people who are seeking my vote what is your plan to address the fundamental racial injustice and inequities that exist in our community? What's your plan? What is your plan to welcome immigrants uh, and to ensure that we are living up to the principles and values that we say this country is about? What is your plan to help bring public banking and participatory budgeting and nurturing worker-owned cooperatives? What is your plan for universal basic income? Simple, right? Uh, and you just say, before I cast my vote, I'm going to, I'm not going to waste my vote on somebody uh, who does not have a plan to get to the world I want to live in. I want to invest my vote in a future. So most of the time is spent over in this circle, building alternatives and fighting the, against the racist, sexist, class oppressive system. During elections, I spend my time saying, what is your plan to get to a, a world that we say we're about? And, you know, when I take that approach, I find that I can, I can build a lot of solidarity with other ordinary people. And it also frankly puts elected officials to the test, right? Like, what is your plan? And you know what? Most of them don't have one. Yeah. Most of them are all actually like the Republicans are just flat out neo-fascist. And most of the Democrats, at least at the leadership level, are just neoliberals who are doubling down on neoliberalism. And again, at the local level, we've got a lot more power to be able to work together on that dual power model.
So, um, I, I, Dick, do you want to ask a question or can I, oh, go can I go to my second part of my question? Yeah. So my, um, I had a second question and you start and you, and you touched on it. I'm very interested, David. I'm always very interested in white men who seem to have racial consciousness, racial awareness, um, well, for lack of a better term, who seem to have been awakened. <laughs> And I want and I want to know what was your experience? How did that happen to you? Well, thank you for the question. Thank you for the compliment. Uh, and also thank you for the question because uh, it so the answer is Serena. Uh, and uh, uh, the the context is, first of all, my hatred of capitalism and economic injustice is not merely intellectual. It's lived experience. I grew up in poverty. Uh, I know what it's like as an eight-year-old boy carrying a five-gallon bucket of my family's excrement to the end of uh, and dumping it into a hole, right? And again, like urban poverty is, is different and worse than rural poverty, but all poverty sucks, right? But my hatred of the economic injustice and system uh, and the shame that I had around it, I, I, I learned that it wasn't my parents' fault, that they weren't bad people, that the system was the problem, right? And again, I learned that through lived experience. But because I'm a cisgendered white male in this body growing up, I bought the rest of the creation myth, right? Of, of the United States is a, uh, the land of liberty, justice, and equality, and that we were the great shining light on the hill, and we were going to bring liberty, justice, and equality to the entire world. And honestly, it wasn't until I got into college uh, that that began to get challenged for me. And look, Partly it happened through my work in the anti-apartheid movement because I was like, apartheid sucks. This is unfair. Like at, the, at a core being like, you know, I'm old enough and y'all are old enough to remember, you know, the anti-apartheid movement. Well, I was, a, I was a student activist there, right? And I also want to be really honest and like vulnerable and transparent uh, to answer your question, Sharon, because at the time I had in my head like, look, I know racial injustice is unfair. And in fact, I'm, I'm working on the anti-apartheid movement. But I wish, I wish that women and people of color would just kind of get over it so we could work on class because that's what, that's what would unite us all, right? But I was too smart to say it out loud. Yeah. But Serena was a black woman who I was very close to and we were intimate, like we were, like, so, so we, were, we were incredibly close, right? And because I knew her and trusted her, I could articulate that, and I did. And I'll, I, I'm getting emotional because I still remember like the look on her face, right? It was a combination of sadness and anger and disappointment, like so many things, right? When I said what I just said, I mean, like if we could just get over it, you know, and then we could, we could build a movement for justice. And she said, David, I know you, you're a good person. I know the words that you think are coming out of your mouth, but I only wish you could hear the words that are coming into my ears as a black woman. Because when you say like, you know, class is the only thing that matters, like has it ever occurred and, and identity politics, has it ever occurred to you that that's because that's your identity? And maybe you bastard that my lived experience as a black woman actually has influenced who I am. And maybe just maybe you're missing something. And I'm, I'm getting emotional, Sharon, because I can still remember then, you ever heard the phrase paradigm shift? Yes. <laughs> that was the moment I can, the, the, like it all started to turn, right? And I, in my body, in my mind, in my heart, I was flooded with shame uh, and embarrassment, but also anger at a system because I am a good person, Sharon. Like, you know, like, uh, and that moment, that moment was when it hit me, like, oh, oppression really is intersectional, right? Like if anything is a power over and dominator, I have to be against that, right? Like, like and, and just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And that's the thing, like positionality matters, Sharon. It's like, so thank you again for the compliment. But what I know is this, I'll never be able to see things that you as a black woman can see. 
right? So I, if I'm going to really be part of a movement to win, I need you so that you can see things and point things out to me. And honestly, you need me so that as a, a white man who came up in poverty, I can see things maybe that you can't see, right? And we need transgendered people and we need immigrant people. Like we need all of us if we're going to dismantle this system. So for me, it was a very personalized experience of somebody who loved me enough to tell me the truth and also to do it in a way that inspired me to be better. She didn't try to shame me. She didn't denigrate me. She genuinely felt sorry for me and helped me to achieve that kind of consciousness. Wow, wow. Yeah, so, so you absolutely exude enthusiasm, confidence, optimism, and I listened to your questions for the, the candidates. Uh, there's no candidate here in Los Angeles that could answer two or three of them that I know of, of, of the major party. Nobody that's going to get win an election. And, and even though in January we had this wonderful event where you and Kali spoke, it was dynamic and people really, really did enjoy it. Maybe 100 people there. I don't know, 150. Uh, but but what we find in those kind of events, it's usually just just the you know the choir there. We were the choir representing all kinds of groups, and that message, your message, as dramatic as it is, it doesn't reach it doesn't reach a lot of people. So so I'm wondering. So really, I wanted to drill down. So what nuts and bolts thing are you doing with the you know like with the solidarity uh, economy ecosystem and the dual power? I mean, what, what practical things are you putting in place? Oh, well, thank you for that. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the compliment. I also want to say this, Dick, like people sometimes say that we're just preaching to the choir, but, you know, I grew up uh, uh, in, in the Baptist church. And one thing I know is when the choir comes together, the choir wants to sing. So <laughs> part of what we ought to be, and let's be clear, the progressive choir is out of tune. Like part of what we need to do is get together and have a little choir practice. So that's number one. <laughs> number two, maybe somebody like, I don't know, Sharon Kyle ought to run for office in Los Angeles uh, in order to have a plan to actually, or people like Sharon uh, ought to run for office. But then the third thing to answer your question directly, not to put you on the spot, Sharon, but like uh, uh, just saying, uh, but uh, Kyle uh, or Dick, what we're doing is we're building uh, and facilitating land back processes. Do you know that we in, in Eureka, uh, Jared Gigi in, in Salatluk, the city returned uh, 800 acres of sacred uh, island, the birthplace of uh, the cosmology for the Wiat people that had also been the site of a horrific massacre. Mm -hmm. So. That was decades of work with the Wiat tribe and, and Eurekans working together. And it started uh, by literally uh, just witnessing on the day that there was supposed to be uh, the ceremony, the world renewal ceremony, uh, Cheryl Seidner, formal uh, tribal administrator and spiritual leader of the Wiat tribe, went to a candlelight vigil and looked at the island. And other, mostly women, started it. But then other people started to show up and not just indigenous people, but white people began to just show up because we heard about this vigil. And so just the power of coming and bearing witness uh, began a narrative, right? And then when the, when, uh, the tribe got access uh, uh, to the land, it, was a it wasn't a super fun site, but it was a hazardous waste site by the EPA. And under WIAT leadership, over 80 tons of metal and garbage and scrap and toxic waste uh, were taken off, including non WIAT people under their leadership. So, this is an example again of a public land back. It was the first time in the history of this country that a municipal government voluntarily returned land, not as a result of a lawsuit or litigation or a court order, right? So the point is, Dick, it happened because we were collaborating. Again, we have to confront our history, but it doesn't have to be our future, 
right? This is the thing, like, uh, because there's a, a shameful history of white supremacy and uh, enslavement of, of Africans and an attempted genocide of the indigenous. We have to confront that, but we can't stay wallowing in it. Our future can be different. So land back, both public, but also private, not one, not two, but three different uh, private lands I have helped to facilitate uh, people returning them to the Wiat tribe. Uh, and we're literally in the process now of building out affordable housing. In fact, I'll send, we just got covered by Next City. I don't know if you're know that, aware of that publication, uh, but our community land trust uh, is uh, being lifted up. We're going to be building 39 units of housing for currently houseless youth. Uh, uh, and uh, again, with preference to indigenous people, but not exclusively for uh, Wiat people. But we're also wrapping services around the youth in an indigenous worldview that says housing first, but not exclusively, because we need we need all like we need to bring our full selves. So, Dick, when I say uh, affordable housing, we're decommodifying land uh, for the least vulnerable amongst us, and we're incubating worker-owned cooperatives, and uh, we're engaging in assisting people to think through co-ops, but not just for the sake of co-ops. Co-ops for commerce, yes, but co-ops also to teach ourselves how to make and implement decisions. Absolutely. You know, one thing I believe in, and you can touch on this, is these work, the whole concept of worker-owned and operated um, cooperatives could change the culture. I believe that we don't know how to live in a democracy. We're so accustomed to tops down, hierarchical, um, where people, you know, from K to 12, well, first when you're born, you're, you know, you got your parents, then K to 12, you got your teacher telling you what to do. And then um, once you get into the working world, you've got your boss telling you what to do. And I think that that's a major contributing factor for why so few people are engaged in their civic responsibilities, including, you know, writing to the editor and not just voting, but more than that, we have responsibilities taking the reins of our, of our um, society. And we don't because we're accustomed to somebody telling us what to do. Or yeah, so true, Sharon, because, and, and, and what, if, you, if they're not telling you what to do, then you tell them what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's never, it's never a collective process of making and implementing decisions together, right? Like either you're the boss and you tell other people what to do, or the boss tells you what to do, right? Like I, I, I like to say that, you know, the most important thing that human children anywhere learn is how to walk and how to talk. And in this current corporatized education system, the first thing that we teach them, sit down and shut up, right? <laughs> like, we're not nurturing children to, to have, like one of the reasons that I am so happy and optimistic, uh, one of them is a happy coincidence of biochemistry. I think I've, I'm just blessed. I don't suffer from the neurodivergence that some people do. And that's a gift. It's a blessing from the goddess. I didn't do anything for it. The other thing I didn't do anything for either. And that was, even though I was reared in poverty, my mama, my mama, and my papa, that's Southern for grandparents uh, who helped to raise me, y'all, they bathed me in love. Like I, 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 like my earliest memories, I know that I was cherished, I was cared for, and they taught me I have something valuable to contribute that I had gifts and they taught me how to offer my gifts properly, right? They taught me to care about other people. They, they, like they, they, in, they enculturated into me that love and compassion uh, were, were virtues and it was the right way to be. And then they, they modeled it and, and made me feel loved, right? So I was just super lucky that way, right? What I'm getting at is that, nurturing uh, was not, we're going to tell you what to do. It was, we want you to be the best version of yourself that you can be. So they literally taught me and modeled for me, oh, here is how you share. Like, you know, here is how, like, and I'll tell you, Sharon, one of the earliest memories that I have as a little boy, I'm probably five, six years old, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting with my, my brother and my cousin, Joe Michael, because I'm from the South. So, you know, <laughs> half the boys have double names, right? But we're fighting over a little toy. It was one of those little matchbox toys, I think. I, 
But I, one thing I, I know for a fact, my mama comes into the room and she's towering over us and we're crying and yelling and fussing. And I remember the first thing is she crouches down and gets down to our level. And she puts her hands on us and literally just soothingly says, Shh, hey, what's going on? And she whispered, what's going on? What's wow. going on? So we had to, in order to be heard, <laughs> hey, what's <laughs> hey, just breathe. What's going on? Oh, oh, here's the problem. There's there's only one of these, but there's three of you. Look, one, everybody count. And she, she one, two, she got us collectively counting together. And then she said, so that's the problem. But, oh, look, I've seen you play with this. I've seen you play with this. And she literally just starts to bring it, toys from around in the circle and says, look, uh, there's enough. And if you really all need to play with just this one right now, well, you just have to share because there's enough to go around as long as you share. And Sharon, it made sense to me as a five-year-old boy. It makes sense to me as a 60-year-old man. There's enough to go around as long as we share. Thank you for sticking like, around. There, if you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.